Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Clemens Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clemens Library. We're so happy to have you joining us today. I just want to tell you a couple of things about Zoom in case you haven't joined the bookworm before. Please go ahead and chime in using the chat function. You can change the settings to everyone so that we can all participate in the conversation. My colleagues, Anne and Lily, will be monitoring the chat and will also be posting helpful information as we go through the presentation. Now, you'll notice that the chat goes by very quickly, so please use the Q&A section for your questions. You can also give other people's questions a thumbs up. That is called an upvote, and we'll send it to the top of the queue. As part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program, we have the live machine captions turned on today. If you go to that button, you can toggle them on or off, and you can also change the size of the words. All of this being said, I can only control so much of what you see today, but I do have side-by-side -side mode enabled, and that will allow you to see both the slides and the speaker. So go ahead and slide the divider so that you can optimize what you're seeing. Okay. This program is brought to you William L. Clements Library, located on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library's mission is to collect, preserve, share, and promote the study and discussion of primary sources related to all aspects of the history and culture of North America and the Caribbean up to 1900. I'd also like to acknowledge that the University of Michigan is located on the territory of the Anishinaabe people. In 1817, the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Badawatomi nations made the largest single land donation to the University of Michigan, often ceremonially as a gift in the text of the Treaty of the Foot of the Rapids, so that their children could be educated in a Western manner. We acknowledge the history of native displacement that allowed the University of Michigan to be founded. Today, we reaffirm contemporary and ancestral Anishinaabek ties to this land and their profound contributions to this institution. In addition, the William L. Clements Library acknowledges that it has and continues to benefit from the original land dispossession and established hierarchies of settler colonialism. Okay, so it's time to finish up our poll question. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Um, and I'll go ahead and stop talking for a second and ask Russ to unmute and comment on the, um, on the results and give us the answer. Whoops, uh, Russ, you're still muted, sorry. Okay, I'm on? Yes. Okay, uh, I, I'm surprised at the how the vote went. It's pretty, especially the top, uh, the top three, top four are all kind of close, but the um, correct answer is Newberry. Uh, Newberry from the 18, 1880s till after World War uh, uh, II, uh, produced uh, tremendous quality quantities of uh, celery. Uh, the high school team was known as the Cellarettes, and it went by a number of celery names. Uh, and uh, when they harvested the celery in the fall, uh, notices would be sent out uh, via newspapers, and people would be waiting at the railroad station to pick up uh, their celery supply. And the restaurants in the in the Upper Peninsula would have a big caption, uh, some on the menu that they were serving Upper Peninsula celery. So it was a kind of a, a major crop, um, 
maybe not a major crop, but it was a big crop and uh, enjoyed by people in the Upper Peninsula. And then it was also shipped out of the area as well into large, down to large urban areas, uh, Detroit, Chicago, and so on. So that's our, our, our uh, look at uh, Newberry, the celery city. That's great. Um, Russ, I'm just muting you for a second. Turn it back on. Uh, I do notice that a couple of people mentioned that uh, sometimes if you have external speakers, that can be a problem with the feedback. So I don't know if you have external speakers that you can move a little further away. All right. I would love to acknowledge that today's episode is generously sponsored by Barbara and Wally Prince. And I also love that the princes are so active in this program, always signing on and participating in the chat. We really appreciate everything that you do for the Clements. And we're so happy to have everyone with us today as well. I'm happy to welcome Dr. Russell Manyagi to talk about his recent book, Classic Food and Restaurants of the Upper Peninsula. After completing his studies at the University of San Francisco and St. Louis University, he moved to Marquette where he taught for 45 years at Northern Michigan University. Russ is a, an award-winning historian, historian of Michigan's Upper Peninsula and has had a decades long curiosity about the food and beverages of the region. He is a prolific researcher and writer, authoring hundreds of articles and many books, as well as appearing on numerous programs like this to share his knowledge and enthusiasm for history. Russ, welcome to the bookworm. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm on. Excellent. Good. And uh, I just thought I'd ask you to give some of our viewers a little more information about the geographical setting of the of the Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Well, the the Upper Peninsula is uh, is seen as a, it's part of the it's seen as part of the Midwest. But again, it's uh, kind of a, it has a non non mid midwestern um, environment in terms of there isn't a great deal of of farming of of say corn farming wheat farming and so on, uh, and it has in its uh, northern environment it has developed an interesting uh, interesting food pattern uh, and. Uh, that becomes part of the, the story of the, the food in the, in the Upper Peninsula is how food developed in basically what people saw as a wilderness area. And what's kind of interesting is that when uh, Native Americans that we'll, we'll look at uh, dealt with the, the environment and then the, the food, uh, how, they, how they collected food, uh, but then you also have the coming of immigrants. And it's interesting that many immigrants, like some of the, some of the Germans, uh, ignored the, the cold climate and the, the, maybe the sandy soil and so on, and experimented with, uh, for instance, fruit crops and whatnot. The, the Blumhubers of Marquette uh, were sending, in the 1860s and 70s, were sending uh, all sorts of fruit to the state fair in Detroit and people were absolutely amazed. And they said, well, where did this come from? They said from the upper peninsula and they couldn't believe it, but everybody told the Blemhuber that it couldn't, couldn't be done. And he said, you know, I'll try and it, and it worked. Great, thank you. That's awesome. Um, Russ, do you have, can you turn the volume down just a on your computer? Pardon me? 
If you're able to turn the volume down on your computer, we might be able to stop the feedback. Okay, is that better? Better, is that better? Yes, yes, okay. it's better. Yay, okay, All perfect. Right. All right, because I want to make sure I can have a conversation with you. Yes. Um, so what initiated your interest in researching UP foods? The, uh, the research for the uh, for the project uh, for the project really I think focuses on uh, my personal curiosity for uh, non traditional non traditional topics and when I came to the Upper Peninsula I was kind of overwhelmed by the iron and the copper story and it uh, that's what everything focused on and my question was who were the people that were taking the copper and the iron out of the ground. Uh, you know, who were these people? And then that leads to what did these people consume uh, when they were here and how did they interact with the, uh, with the environment? So that was kind of the thing that got me started. And that started soon after I arrived, or I mean, within a few days when I came to, came to Marquette to start my, uh, my, uh, uh, my teaching uh, career at Northern, uh, I remember asking uh, a Finnish American fellow, I said, well, where's a good Finnish restaurant in Marquette? And he looked at me and kind of perplexed and he said, Finns only eat white food and fish. We don't have any, uh, we don't have any restaurants. And that kind of got, got me started. What is you know, uh, what are the restaurants in the Upper Peninsula and, you know, uh, what do they eat? And then, uh, you know, uh, you come across as a, as a recent uh, uh, arrival, you come across the, the, uh, the pasty, which you, you mispronounce right away. And then you begin to see, and then there's some Italian restaurants that uh, uh, were popular. Uh, but uh, for instance, one of the things that you didn't have back in the, in the 1970s were uh, Asian restaurants, Chinese restaurants and so on, didn't exist. Uh, Mexican restaurants didn't exist in the, in the Upper Peninsula. So you're, uh, you, you didn't have, except for the Italian restaurants, uh, the Scandinavians didn't really get into restaurants and uh, you just had regular Midwestern American food, hamburgers, you know, were, were the big, uh, the big delight, you might say. Right, right. Um, I love, though, that this all starts with that curiosity and that serendipity. We have a lot of researchers at the Clements right now, and it's fun, fun to talk to them and see how the questions that they ask lead them through the archives in, um, you know, sometimes unexpected ways. So maybe tell us, you know, how this story starts. Well, the the uh, the story of food in the in the Upper Peninsula, uh, you start with the the Native American. Uh, the uh, Native American people, and uh, they had, uh, they didn't have uh, really the, the traditional Native uh, foods uh, like tomatoes and beans and corn, in particular corn, and farming was all but impossible. You can grow things here, but you also have to grow enough of them to last you through the year. So the Native American people, the, the, uh, uh, Ojibwe and the Adawa, Anishinaabe people, uh, they then uh, turned to the uh, turned to the uh, to the land, and uh, were hunters and gatherers and and really fishermen, and so they were um, uh, into uh, gathering uh, maple maple uh, sap and then turning it into maple sugar. Uh, which is rich in vitamin C. Uh, sometimes during the, uh, uh, the uh, sugaring time, uh, they would spend a month and uh, their diet consisted of 100% uh, 
maple sugar. So they were making it, consuming it, but making enough. So that, that was important. Uh, another item that uh, replaces uh, corn uh, is uh, wild rice. And uh, wild rice is, is important, uh, grows across, grew across the Upper Peninsula till the, the beds were destroyed during the logging, logging boom in the 19th century. Uh, but that was important. And the, uh, you had berries and mushrooms and so on. But the, the, um, the, the uh, basic food for the, uh, the native people of the Upper Peninsula uh, was uh, fish. And fish was about 75% of their diet. And uh, the fish would be uh, uh, gathered in the, in the summertime it's at, at special locations, the Straits of Mackinac, Sault Ste. Marie, um, uh, uh, Lance, Keebanaw Bay, and so on. So that was extremely important. And then to a lesser degree, uh, all sorts of uh, other animals. Uh, uh, venison was important, and then even birds, passenger pigeons, and, and so on. So they they really focused to uh, focused on the on the environment, what the environment could could produce for them. So they're basically hunters, gatherers, and fishers. Great. Um, let's see what else. Oh. And uh, the uh, here we have a, a native uh, native person with uh, uh, a load of strawberries. And when the uh, what you have occurring is when the the Americans and the Europeans came into the Upper Peninsula, there's going to be a, a cre cre creolization of the food culture, and you're going to find that uh, the this, for instance, uh, the the Scandinavians in particular uh, were familiar with berry culture from where they came from, and they came to the UP, and they had all these these wild berries, and then native. Uh, berry sellers would go from door to door selling various uh, various berries, in particular in particular uh, blueberries. So it was a coming together, really, of the two of the two cultures that worked quite well. The the other the other development was the uh, the the Europeans were were. Attaching themselves to to native foods, but for instance, the French will bring in uh, will bring in uh, apples and pears, and uh, <clears throat> they become part of the they grow up grow here in the UP, and they become part of the uh, uh, part of the uh, the uh, food culture. And then later on, Native Americans will have apple orchards and develop it. And uh, the, the French then in these small gardens at Fort Michelin-Mackinac would grow various herbs, garlic and stuff, all of the products that they were, uh, they were used to uh, in their cooking and so on. And so you have then the beginnings of uh, European agriculture. As a matter of fact, uh, Father Marquette, who settled Sault Ste. Marie in 1668, uh, tried, to, uh, tried to grow grapes and wheat. Uh, for the Catholic Mass, and that didn't that didn't work out. But the the other thing that he was trying to do was to introduce agriculture uh, to the uh, to the native people. And part of the um, part of the problem was that uh, the native native foods would run out. And so when you got into the into the springtime. Things got, and this happened in Europe and as well. Uh, things got a little uh, dicey because the the food supply was greatly, greatly reduced or uh, didn't exist. And that's why when the uh, March, April came and you start uh, gathering maple uh, maple sugar, uh, uh, people were quite delighted. They had a, a basic food source uh, for themselves. Right. Yeah, I we think of it as a treat, but it was a necessity. And it was and and the the, the other thing to to remember is that and people don't put this together, but uh, maple sugar production, I would consider an industry. Uh, 
Uh, you need uh, groups of people. You have to be highly organized. Even today, when people, uh, uh, you know, local people uh, make um, maple syrup and, and sometimes sugar, uh, it's, a, it's a major project. Uh, they have to keep the fires burning and so on. They have to gather the... Uh, uh, the uh, the syrup, uh, the uh, sap, and so on. And so I would say that uh, uh, maple sugaring was a uh, early uh, industry, agricultural industry uh, in well, not only the the Upper Peninsula, but in uh, Michigan in in general. Okay. And then one of the kind of one of the the important developments that everybody then gets involved with, you might say, uh, but the French are going to introduce uh, bread, uh, and they have these outdoor ovens, as you see here at uh, the one at uh, one at uh, Fort Michilimackinac, and they would uh, they would uh, heat the oven up. And then put in the uh, the processed dough and so on, and it would uh, would bake. And then when the bread was done and the and the fire is kind of cool, they would put in various uh, sweets and so on, cookies and and the like. And uh, you're going to find that uh, Native Americans then will not so much build ovens, but they will actually uh, bake bread uh, in frying pans. And this was also done by the mixed blood people, the Meti people, the voyageurs and so on. And some of the early uh, uh, people that came up here were absolutely astonished that the result was this uh, soft, delicious bread that was made in a frying pan. But the, uh, the bread culture is going to spread and uh, you're going to find that uh, Scandinavians uh, the Swedes and fin, uh, uh, Finns uh, are going to become bakers all across the Upper Peninsula and op open up uh, bakeries. Italians will do the same and other ethnic groups, uh, maybe not as many as the Scandinavians, but they all got involved in, in baking. The, the interesting thing about the, the oven is that, and as I was doing the study, I get into what people were drinking and they were drinking coffee. And so coffee would come in bulk uh, as coffee beans, green coffee beans. Uh, then they were ground. And then the, um, uh, the coffee was roasted in these ovens. And this then coffee, coffee consumption becomes, um, well, among Finns, it's um, an important part of their, their lives. Uh, certainly, certainly with the Finnish immigrants, even today, Finland is the uh, uh, Finland is the high uh, is the largest consumer of Finnish people are the largest consumers of coffee in the world, and so it's just part of their their culture. And I remember when I first came here, uh, arrived, and I had an interview with the dean and so on. Uh, they handed you a cup of coffee. That was just part of life in the Upper Peninsula, and continues to be. Oh, nice. And you have when the uh, when the when the voyageurs came to uh, came to the Upper Peninsula working, uh, they would come with a, a supply of and and this was not only the voyageurs but the explorers that came, the American explorers that came uh, came with a supply of um, salt pork. Uh, probably it could be best described as kind of bacon, some form of bacon that people can relate to. And they would have uh, the, uh, pounds of, of bacon uh, the, and uh, flour, and then uh, biscuits or dry bread would, uh, would be part of their, uh, their diet. And this didn't last them the whole, t the whole time they were, they were you know, exploring or trading and so on. And then they would have to rely on native, native people providing them with, um, um, Dried, uh, dried venison, um, uh, fish, and uh, and then the big thing was wild rice. As I said, wild rice was the was the staple, 
and wild rice is going to be the, um, uh, I have to excuse the, the background sound, the uh, wild rice was the, uh, the staple and the, uh, so the, again, you had this cre cre creolization of the, uh, the French and the Americans, everybody that came uh, then latched onto uh, uh, native, uh, native food. Uh, I should point out that uh, the French were more apt to uh, plug into uh, native foods uh, where the English, when the English came after 1763, they tended to keep away from native foods. And we find this with the archeological digs around Fort Michilimackinac. When you get to the, uh, to the uh, uh, English sites, uh, there is a lot of domestic, domestic bone is to be found there. So they were consuming uh, uh, sheep, uh, hogs, uh, cattle. Uh, as opposed to the, the French would have some of that, chickens, uh, they'd have some of that, but uh, they also uh, were consuming uh, native foods, the fish, the venison, and so on. So that was, and this is kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting photograph because this is uh, 1915, but this could be 1715 with the, maybe the costumes would be a little different but this is the way the, um, uh, the explorers, the fur traders, uh, the missionaries and so on, how everybody uh, ate uh, along the, the shores of Lake Superior, Lake Michigan and so on, as they did their, uh, their work in the Upper Peninsula. This is quite a bounty. And this is uh, now a very interesting uh, a connection with that, with the native culture. And what you're going to find is, and there are many, many photographs similar to this one, but here you have a fellow that, and, and the food was, was consumed. It wasn't just, you know, they didn't just go out hunting and see how many uh, animals they could get, but they actually then processed it. But here you have the, the venison, uh, the, uh, uh, the rabbit, uh, rabbits, and then uh, some birds uh, up above uh, around him. And this was extremely, uh, uh, extremely, it becomes part of life in the Upper Peninsula. And you also have scenes of, uh, and, and there might be some, income, some coming along here, of uh, really extravagance where you have whole walls uh, with uh, various animals hanging. And uh, it's uh, then eventually the state of Michigan is going to get into um, uh, various laws that are going to bring some control. But uh, in the early days, people would literally take hundreds of fish and uh, animals and so on. And uh, hopefully they, and they were consumed. They would also, though, uh, they were, it got commercialized because they would also ship the, uh, ship the, the animals out of state. And that becomes one of the first laws that prohibited the export of, uh, of uh, uh, hunted animals uh, from, uh, from Michigan to, uh, to neighboring states and so on. Uh, but this is kind of, this is the coming together of the European and the, the, native, the native diet. Right, right. Um, so here we have sort of an iconic food at the UP. Okay. Well, the the uh, uh, we can talk about the the sort of the three introduced foods uh, to the Upper Peninsula. Uh, one is the probably the most iconic, the most important uh, is the pasty, and the pasty is a freestanding uh, meat meat, potato, rutabaga pie, and it was introduced by the Cornish people. And the, uh, the pasties that these two miners are consuming are really half the size of a typical Cornish pasty. A typical Cornish pasty, uh, when you ate it, you needed two hands uh, to consume it. Uh, but it, it works well for the miners because they would go to work with a, with a warm pasty, uh, sometimes just putting it in their shirt, keeping it 
uh, keeping it warm. And then by the time uh, lunchtime came, they would, um, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, when by the time lunchtime came, it was cooler, but it was a full meal. And a pasty consists of uh, chopped meat, uh, potatoes, uh, and onions, uh, rutabaga, uh, and then other other items. And it's a simple a simple recipe, but gets you into a lot of trouble with various aficionados. What exactly goes into the pasty? Is the pass is the meat supposed to be ground, and then what type of meat goes into the pass? Should the uh, should the meat be uh, diced, and the same thing with the with the vegetables that go into the that go into the pasty. So it's a, a simple recipe, but with a whole uh, a whole variety of of uh, of, of uh, ideas by different people as to. Uh, just exactly in terms of the size. I can say personally, the best pasty I ever had, I, I gave a talk years ago uh, to a group and the dinner was, and it's very common and has been uh, over the years, dinner is a pasty. And um, it was absolutely delicious. And, and I couldn't figure it, you know, I couldn't figure it out. It's the, you know, the usual ingredients. And then I looked at it carefully and the difference was the ingredients were finely, finely chopped so that you weren't, you didn't eat a chunk of meat and then a, a chunk of potato and a carrot and a rutabaga and so on, but you were eating all of the ingredients blended together. And it, it was the most delicious pasty I've ever had. And uh, so when you, so from my perspective, you see one of many and I'm not a big pasty maker my perspective if I you know if I was I would chop the uh, the ingredients very finely and mix them so that when you you had a mouth of pasty you would have all the flavors there and uh, but the, but the pasty because as I said becomes iconic and everybody then picked it up the the Cornish women then showed the Finnish women, the Italian women, the Swedish, and so on and so on, how to make the pasty. And then they added their own ingredients and so on. And I should point out that uh, the pasty, uh, not from the UP, but from Cornwall, there were Cornish miners that went to Mexico and they brought the pasty to Mexico. And you can go to uh, an old mining ta uh, town, I think Cholula, northwest, northeast of Mexico City, and you can buy a pasty. And I asked, I said, well, did the Mexicans then add chili peppers and so on? They said, no, it is a, an authentic pasty. So the pasty has kind of spread around the world. The thing about the pasty is that it's iconic in the Upper Peninsula, okay? Uh, Cornish miners then went to Butte, Montana, to the copper mines there, and the pasty remains uh, an important, you know, a, a food in Butte, Montana. The, uh, the big difference is, which, which uh, horrifies uh, youpers, uh, you get the pasty uh, with uh, gravy. Uh -oh. and that is, you, you, can, you can ask for gravy in the Upper Peninsula, uh, but, um, uh, but and in Butte, Montana, it comes automatically. The other place that is a little center of pasty making is Grass Valley, California, an old gold mining town. And then they they're into pasties in southwest uh, Wisconsin. And those are kind of the the really the big areas. Though now you do get uh, pasties being sold, for instance, in Traverse City. There's a, uh, uh, a pasty shop there. And then around Detroit, uh, pasties are, are, uh, are, are made. Then the, uh, uh, you also have with the, with the pasty, uh, you have there, you go online and there's a pasty trail. When you come to the UP, where are the various uh, pasty shops? And that's one of the characteristics. You see where it's a simple food, but for instance, it has its own, um, sources of production and the source of production is a pasty shop 
and I know it's it's no longer in the in the yellow pages of the um, uh, of the phone books, but at one point there was a citation pasty, and then they'd list the pasty shops. So across the UP, except for a few few exceptions, very few exceptions, restaurants do not uh, offer a pasty. You have to go to like Lowry's Pasty Shop, Gene Case Pasty Shop in Marquette, Lido's Pasty Shop, uh, kind of famous over by uh, St. Ignace. And that's where you get the pasty, or you can buy them from various church groups uh, that oh. will make them on a monthly basis. But they're, they're you know, they, it's so involved uh, in, in terms of production, producing them uh, that uh, a, a uh, restaurant unless that's all they're selling. One of the, one of the characteristics of a UP food. So Russ, um, back when it started with these miners, they weren't buying them in a shop, right? Their wives were making them first thing in the morning. Yeah, it, start, yeah, it started that the, uh, the, uh, the, the Cornish made, the, the, the Cornish wives made the, uh, the cousin Jenny's Made the made the pasties for their husbands, and they had to do it do it correctly. There are all sorts of stories where uh, in in the Cornish dialect that there's there's too much uh, turnip or there's too much this or that. So the the miners wanted a perfect pasty, and so the wife had to be very very careful to produce the the perfect pasty uh, pasty for them. And then from the from the families, and then non-Cornish families and whatnot. Then it went to churches. Various church groups would make pasties. The women uh, would make pasties uh, for, um, uh, you know, for, uh, to make money for their organization of the church and so on. And then you started to get uh, people developing pasty shops. And uh, that becomes, uh, the, the first pasty shops I found were, kind of in the nine, late 1920s, 30s as people, and they started like at Ironwood, uh, where tourists were coming into the Upper Peninsula. And so a number of people put up a little pasty shop, put up the sign. Obviously, nobody knew what this thing was. They stopped to find out, and they encountered their first pasty. And these kind of spread then, uh, but then the, the real flourishing of pasty shops came in the... Um, uh, in the World War II period, the 1950s, like the Lido pasty shop, John Lido was a veteran. He didn't know what to do and uh, decided to open a pasty shop. And it's in full swing there, just west of, uh, west of St. Ignace on US 2. Everybody sort of knows uh, Lido's pasty shop. Right, right. Um, I think our next slide is another. Uh, iconic uh, food from the UP? Well, I included the, I was looking at the different foods and Mackinac fudge is, yes, is a, um, is an a, <laughs> iconic food of the Upper Peninsula, though a lot of times people will, will say, well, Mackinac Island is not part of the Upper Peninsula. And, and yes, it is, it is part of the Upper Peninsula. And uh, it's, um, even gone to the point of uh, a number of years ago, I think Riba, Mr. Riba went and got a outfit down in, uh, in Port Huron to make a Mackinac Island fudge ice cream. And that's become, uh, that's become rather, uh, rather popular around, well, kind of a, around the Midwest and across the, across the country. So that remains a, uh, a major feature of the Upper Peninsula. There, there was a story that, uh, that uh, kind of during the Cold War, back in the 1970s, I remember hearing and people would joke that if um, uh, Fidel Castro had gotten the, uh, gotten the uh, sugar contract with the, with the Mackinac fudge makers, uh, he would have ne never turned to communism. He would have been totally, uh, his, his economy would have been and They sell uh, literally tons of, uh, of fudge, excuse me. Uh, they sell uh, literally tons of fudge during the, during the, in a single day on Mackinac Island. 
And if you've been there, you, you know the whole, the whole process. And then it was also the, um, I guess the Murdoch family uh, decided to put fans on the, on the store so they could, could spread the smell of, of uh, processing uh, fudge to draw people into the, into the shop. So again, you have kind of a simple, you know, a, a, a product made with sugar and so on, but becomes iconic with a lot of little parts and pieces to it. And I think, well, President Ford, uh, who visited Mackinac Island uh, during his presidency, uh, stopped at one of the one of the uh, fudge shops, the only president known to have stopped at the fudge shop. And I think his favorite fudge was pecan, vanilla pecan or something. And um, uh, so that's again, that's kind of a whole uh, very very briefly the whole uh, overview of of the uh, the fudge uh, the fudge story. Right, and it's it's definitely a very special. Um, food to get when you're traveling up there. Yes. And now for something completely different. Okay, then, then we have, the, this is the, uh, another kind of, a, it was iconic to the central upper peninsula, the kudigi. And the kudigi is basically a North Italian sausage, uh, but its uh, origins kind of got lost and it sort of became almost near mysterious in terms of, um, of the name, where did the name come from and so on. We could, we could never track that down. And then I did a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of the work was talking to people and talking about the flavor of the, the kudigi. And I remember we were on a, uh, uh, we were on a, on a ferry going from Stockholm to Turku, Finland. And as the boat's coming in, I'm talking to one of the one of the friends that was on the boat and we were talking about about kudigi and he said yes my family made it and we saw that it, it ended up being a, a north italian uh, sausage that was centered around the upper uh, the central upper peninsula you could ask for kudigi people knew what you're talking about you went to iron mountain or houghton nobody knew what you're talking about today the original recipe which is in the book uh, has been superseded by everybody making their own kudigi sausage and so on. So, and you can travel to these places and they'll know what you're talking about. They'll give you a kudigi sandwich. Uh, the fellow that kind of really got it going, uh, the father of the kudigi is Mario Gualiozzi. And uh, he arrived in Ishpeming in 1929 from Bergamo, uh, Italy, um, Northern Italy, North of Milan. And he introduced the, the coup de gui, though people uh, question this. I just had the other day, I had someone say, no, 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 it was Felix, Felix Barbier. But with food, there are a lot of parts and, and, and people that are involved in it. So he seems to have introduced it. And uh, then his, um, it was then picked up by other people who popularized it, made it available. And uh, today, I guess the, the big, uh, the place to get your best kudigi is Ralph's Delicatessen in, uh, in Ishpeme. Everybody says that's it. But most grocery stores, most uh, the, uh, butcher shops and whatnot uh, sell their own uh, variation of kudigi. And it's gone from, for instance, North Italian sausage, the original kudigi is, is a mild sausage with various spices. Uh, the, uh, some of the kudigi that are made today that are available have a fennel and hot chili peppers and so on. And that is more of a South Italian sausage. So you can see where it's been developed for various tastes. If you like hot spicy uh, sausage, uh, you get the spicy. And so uh, Ralph's I know has uh, mild, medium and hot. And uh, people literally travel miles to uh, to visit the visit the deli, which is closed for the summer. It's interesting uh, how food and other things get they get in the way. Uh, Ralph's closed for the summer, and they're dividing their store into two parts. The front part is going to be selling cannabis, and the back part is selling kudigi and other Italian other Italian products. Everybody's getting kind of a kick out of that. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah, it's <laughs> fun to see how these foods are changed and incorporated. And the uh, a, a group of people that uh, uh, that got into uh, got into uh, ice cream and confectionery, uh, candy making, and so on. Uh, the, the two major people were Greeks and Lebanese, and the and the Lebanese are. Excuse me. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the Lebanese are usually um, uh, identified as Turks because he came from the Turkish Empire in the late 19th century. Uh, but the Lebanese, uh, basically these people came with, you know, few uh, skills and things to offer, but they knew they could make candy. They could take uh, 10 pounds of of uh, sugar and turn it into candy. And so they're going to develop uh, they're going to develop candy shops. They're going to develop ice cream, ice cream shops, uh, light luncheons, as you see here with Lindell's. And by the way, Lindell's up in Lake Linden in the Copper Country uh, is still in business. And uh, you can go in there. It is, and I would recommend anyone that's visiting the Copper Country uh, to make sure you stop at Lindell's. Uh, it is lined, it's an old fashioned uh, lunch, uh, lunch shop, and it's lined with walnut wood and the, the uh, fancy tabletops and so on, the booths, and it's a tremendous experience, both for the food and the environment. But you're going to, and the other, the other shop that is, uh, uh, that has kept in business since 1906 is Sakely's. They were Lebanese in uh, Escanaba and they are, they continue to make, they're the only really big candy makers uh, in the Upper Peninsula. But back in the late 19th, early through the 20th century, uh, there were uh, Greek and Lebanese candy shops in uh, just about every community in the Upper Peninsula. Okay, and continuing to talk about people who came to the Upper Peninsula. And we have, the, then there were, you know, there've been all sorts of uh, uh, ethnic developments in terms of various foods that become, uh, become popular. And one that's uh, uh, popular in the, in the summertime is Croatian chicken. And they've developed this, uh, uh, this contraption, this uh, rather intricate barbecue, and uh, they uh, barbecue the chickens. They're constantly rotating, and uh, Croatian chicken is sold at uh, well various uh, places that are uh, raising funds, historical societies. But then at the uh, the county fairs, Marquette County Fair, and then the um, uh, the, the state fair in Escanaba, and you will get lines like you can't believe, uh, you know, at dinner time, there will be a line 100 feet long uh, waiting to get uh, Croatian chickens. Uh, other foods that were kind of interesting, uh, and I'll just mention, uh, was the, the Swedish smorgasbord. And um, uh, Swedish smorgasbord would be a whole variety of, of, uh, of foods and so on. And then the Swedes got upset when other ethnic groups then used the term. But instead of serving a herring and, and various foods, uh, the other groups would serve uh, ravioli and, and pasta and uh, non-Swedish non food. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big uh, uh, events, which is, is rarely done today uh, was a thing called Little Christmas that was celebrated by the, the Finns and the Swedes, usually before Christmas in the middle of December. And they would have a huge a table full, a groaning table filled with, with hams and, and various types of fish and so on. And then another table you see here with a whole variety of sweets. And some of those tables would be like 10 feet long, three feet wide, and completely uh, filled with 
uh, with uh, with various pastries. Uh, so when when you got done it got done with the main meal, you then went into a second main meal of sweets. Right. The uh, the introduction of beer, and I I did a book on beer in the Upper Peninsula and found that it was first introduced in the 1600s. And uh, local, the French, and then especially the English would make beer in place of hops, they would use spruce and uh, spruce tips. And uh, then it uh, really spread with the arrival of German, uh, German immigrants. Uh, Nicholas Volker was really the first bre brewer, he and, and some associates at Sault Ste. Marie in the summer of 1850, started a small brewery. And then brewing uh, just extend, expanded. Uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, here's the Menominee River Brewing Company, but there were three big breweries in uh, Menominee and Menominee had a very large German population. Uh, but all of the communities in the Upper Peninsula had at least one brewery. Usually they had uh, two in the Copper Country. Uh, there were, I, I think there were about uh, a half dozen uh, breweries in a very, uh, very limited area. And here we have the, the very famous uh, House of Ludington. Uh, it was established in the 1860s and then over the years here you have, you can see it's been expanded and it's been further expanded. But the House of Ludington became extremely famous for uh, its restaurant and Pat Hayes was a self-educated chef and did his utmost to provide the, the best food, the best environment uh, as kind of a slap in the face to uh, George III who lost the, the American colonies in the revolution. He called his, his restaurant uh, the George III, his dining room, excuse me, the George III room. And he had he ordered uh, a complete complete set for the for the res, uh, for the restaurant a complete set of uh, Waterford Crystal, and everything was was the finest. And his uh, whole idea was that whatever the Waldorf Astoria could produce, he could produce. So it didn't matter if you were in the Upper Peninsula, disconnected from a large city or whatever, uh, you could, you could uh, produce fine food. One, uh, he would have big dinners for hunters at the beginning of hunting season. And uh, to give you an idea of what he, what he could do, he had quail, a sword served to the hunters. Uh, so he had some very elaborate, um, uh, elaborate meals. Uh, he had the most, the most complete, authentic Swedish smorgasbord in uh, ever produced. I don't think it'll ever be produced uh, again uh, for a visiting Swedish prince uh, who came to Escanaba. Wow. Um, the uh, does does the House of Ludington still stand today in Escanaba? The, the House of Ludington, after uh, Pat Hayes passed, uh, it went to his manager. He kind of just passed it to his, his manager. And then after that, you didn't have the, 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 the foods, I would call it the food spirit to produce the best and so on. But uh, in its heyday, it attracted people from all over the Midwest. People knew the House of Ludington. They knew, uh, they knew Pat Hayes. And it was just, it was, uh, people would, for instance, have, uh, you know, uh, various receptions and whatnot. And they would travel from Marquette, uh, the 90 or so miles, 70 miles, 90 miles to Escanaba uh, to have the event celebrated at the, uh, the House of Ludington. And even today, as I say, you know, when you mention the House of Ludington or Pat Hayes, uh, people know who you're talking about and what you're talking about.
and then sort of at the other <laughs> the other end of, of dining is the the drive-in and obviously during the heyday of the drive-in back in the 1950s and so on uh, drive-ins crisscross the the upper peninsula especially the a and w root beer stand uh, they were in every every community today there are five uh, five drive-ins in the Upper Peninsula, and the uh, Clyde's drive-in, there are three of them, Manistique, St. Ignace, Sault Ste. Marie, and it has sort of been unofficially declared the iconic drive-in in in the state of Michigan, and uh, uh, you go there, and it's uh, usually filled with, it's open year-round, it's filled with cars. They did extremely well during the pandemic, because nobody was eating indoors and everybody was going to uh, going to the uh, to the drive-in. As I said, there were five of them, and I talked to the fellow that owns one up at uh, Sault Ste. Marie. There are two in Sault Ste. Marie, and he said, "We're doing a land office business. We just can't keep up with the people that uh, come to the drive-in and can, don't have to." And and so they closed the the little dining area they had. They closed, and it, it was all. Uh, food to the car and and watch the uh, the ships go through the locks. Yeah, um, I think this th- that during the heyday there were a lot of strange themes for these drive-ins as well, right? Well, you, yeah, the the uh, the um, drive-ins then uh, took on various uh, characteristics. Uh, here you have the variety of costumes. They have uh, uh, kind of a Native American uh, motif here to the place and to the uh, uh, to the to the car hops and so on. Uh, there was a fellow in Escanaba that had almost a uh, kind of a Native village that he established, and kind of in the center of it was a uh, was a drive-in. Uh, but it was a big tourist, uh, big tourist attraction, and you had a lot of that across the across the Upper Peninsula, sort of the the fake Indian uh, Indian tradition that uh, that uh, grew and developed through the area. Right. And then one uh, one area that we don't usually don't uh, think about, and that is the the lumber camps, and these these lumber camps had their own, their own cuisine. Uh, the men would be up uh, six o'clock, seven o'clock for a day working in the woods in the winter. And they consumed vast, vast quantities of food. Uh, today, you would shudder uh, the oils, the butters, the, the, the bacon. Uh, if, uh, if you're into dieting or something, you'd just be shocked by what they're eating and some of these some of these men would eat a after they had their meal they would then consume uh, several dozen donuts and you know finish off their their meal with several dozen donuts or a complete pie and then go out in the woods but then they were burning it burning it off because they're out in the cold uh, and that helps, and then doing this very, very uh, hard work and so on. And then at noon, the, um, uh, the cookie, as he was called, uh, would uh, bring warm food to them. And then in the evening, they had another major meal. So uh, this was a whole, um, a whole part of the food culture that we kind of overlook. Right. That's one of the things I love about your book is... Um how you've explored all of these different themes. And you had, uh, and, and the, there, there are, uh, well, well, we'll take a look at the sort of, you know, and I'm not, I have to talk about the Grand Hotel. I'm not trying to, to advertise, but it, it's there. And it is the, today is the ultimate, um, I guess I would say collection of food restaurants and uh, probably uh, many of the viewers uh, have been there and you've been to the main dining room at the Grand Hotel uh, and um, <clears throat> this is it in the 1920s and it pretty much remains, uh, remains the same. Uh, but the Grand Hotel now has, I think it's a total of five different restaurants that are uh, scattered around the, around the property and uh, uh, it's said to have the largest kitchen in the world. 
and they start producing, uh, the bakers start producing uh, pastries and croissants and so on at 10 o'clock the evening before uh, for, the, for the next morning. And uh, it's, uh, it's I would say it's a bit ex it's a bit expensive to say the least, or you have to not eat for several days and then go for the, the especially the luncheon. But I do have to say it is an experience to have a meal in the grand uh, the grand dining room at the uh, at the hotel. Uh, it's uh, and the, the other thing that's that's interesting about it is they they still have an all black wait staff. And this started back in having using a, a black wait staff and, and, uh, and cooks and so on, or chefs uh, started in the 1850s, even maybe a little earlier on Mackinac Island has continued. And uh, today uh, they import uh, Jamaicans uh, to, uh, to work uh, at, the, at the Grand Hotel. And there's been there been all sorts of controversy. Why are they hiring? Uh, why are they hiring uh, black people to serve and and so on? And it's part of the tradition. I think they're in the process of kind of breaking some of that down. There've been complaints uh, by visitors and so on. Uh, and then why don't they use American American uh, blacks and so on? Uh, part of the problem is uh, blacks or whites aren't really into that service type. Uh, uh, career and they can't they can't get them. But uh, the the Grand Hotel for its food, uh, I would recommend it at least at least once. Or if you have a lot of money, you might want to go. You might want to go a few times. But it's just a, a tremendous dining dining experience. And as I said, it is the I would say the Grand Hotel is the ultimate dining experience in the in the Upper Peninsula. Right. Um... So as we were talking about having you on the program, we looked around a little bit in the collection and I know that you also used some of these kinds of cookbooks for your research. And we just thought this one was so lovely and it was part of the collection of um, the wife of former uh, director Howard Peckham. So it was part of Dorothy Peckham's cookbooks donated by her daughter, Angela. And so how, how do you use a, um, a cookbook like this in the kind of research that you've done? Well, the, over the years, because I've been interested and uh, when I started collecting some of these, some of these cookbooks and kind of got into the history, uh, they were selling for a dollar. They were like at the end of the, the antique table, uh, people weren't buying them. Uh, that is completely changed. Today, if you go to a, an antique show or something, uh, you're going to pay a little more than a dollar for one of these books. But they're a, um, uh, an, a, a good entry into what people were, uh, were eating uh, back in, say, 1893 and so on. But there are a few cautions that you have to keep in mind. So they are a source of recipes. But you have to remember that especially immigrant women or women in general, I guess, uh, would consider, you know, the, the most valuable they, thing that they had in their lives was making food. And so a lot of times when you go into the recipes of these cookbooks, you find that maybe it's not, and, and some people, and we were kind of talking about grandparents and, and grandmother and, and the recipe, uh, they didn't include all the techniques of uh, processing, uh, you know, right. processing food. And as a result, uh, you're not going to have the exact recipe. But these, uh, these cookbooks that were uh, produced by primarily by uh, church, um, uh, church ladies, we call them, uh, kind of crisscross, well, crisscrossed America, but certainly the Upper Peninsula. And uh, I ran across one, one of these books. Uh, the, uh, the woman said that she had, she knew I collected books. And we were at a, a history conference and um, she shows me this, this book that's a bilingual Finnish American cookbook. And it was produced for domestic servants. So young Finnish 
uh, immigrant girls could then get jobs as domestic servants, and they proceeded to uh, they 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 would they could then uh, serve uh, work for a uh, uh, an American family and produce American type food. And so that was the whole the whole purpose of the of the cookbook. So the, these cookbooks had all sorts of, of uh, uh, focuses, uh, raising money for uh, church ladies and so on, and various church groups, uh, helping domestic servants with uh, uh, serving uh, an American uh, you know an American meal that right. they would be uh, connected with. But the interesting thing about this this book that I encountered. Uh, is that it went into, I bought like the third edition. So it was obviously very popular uh, with, with Finnish immigrants. And it um, also had a lot of authentic, because I had a, a woman who grew up in a Finnish household go through it, and it had authentic Finnish recipes from, from the immigrants from the 1920s. And so it's the, these cookbooks are really very helpful, you know, if you want to get into kind of food culture, they're very interesting to go and look at, and then maybe produce uh, some of the foods from the uh, from that time, and see what people were eating. And they weren't eating uh, uh, casseroles. And that's sort of what eventually comes out of some of this. I know at Northern Michigan University in the in the early days, of the uh, 20th century, they would have a um, uh, some kind of a banquet, and I looked at the the photographs of these banquets, and they were covered with uh, with casseroles, a whole variety of casseroles. Uh, so these these cookbooks are good uh, windows into enjoying the past, reliving the past. Yeah, definitely. Um, Russ, I'm gonna meet you for just a couple of minutes. And just tell everybody, wow, this has been such a good conversation. And I know we're a little bit over on the time. Um, we'll still answer lots of questions. I see that we have lots of good questions in the Q&A section. So go ahead and keep putting those in there and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Just a couple of quick um comments and announcements. I wanted to mention that you might have noticed Superior View credited for many of these photos. And um, Russ knows Jack Dio, who is the collector of um, Upper uh, Peninsula photography and has used um, many of those photos in, in the book. As well, I wanted to mention that Jack was a guest on the Bookworm back in 2020 and shared his collection of outdoor photography from the Upper Peninsula. So if you're interested, you can watch a recording of that program as well. Next month, I'll be joined by historian and author Carolyn Eastman to talk about her book, The Strange Genius of Mr. O, The World of the the United States' First Forgotten Celebrity. The book is both a biography of a remarkable performer, a gaunt Scottish orator who appeared in a toga, and also a story of the United States during the founding era. Um, as a registrant of the bookworm, you will receive a reminder next month to join us, but if you're unable to do so live, you'll also receive an email after the program with a link to the recording. There's also still time to come physically to the Clements Library to view the student curated exhibit, Navigating Disability in, the in 19th Century America. We are offering some guided tours as well, so you can click on the link in the chat to register for one of those, or if you're around town, you can stop by to browse the exhibit between noon and 4.30, Monday through Friday. Speaking of in town, uh, if you're around for the Ann Arbor Art Fair next week, we'd love for you to stop by our tent and say hello. Um, it's always fun to see people in real life as well as online. I'm excited to mention that we have over 1,100 volunteers working on our crowdsourcing project, Picturing Michigan's Past. 
That being said, there's still plenty of time for you to join in this project and help us identify and categorize over 60,000 real photo postcards from the David V. Tinder collection of Michigan photography. If you've already been working on this project, I'd love for you to mention in the chat um, some of the your favorite photos from the project. And once again, thank you so much to Barbara and Wally Prince for sponsoring today's episode of The Bookworm. And if any of you are interested in sponsoring a future episode, you can contact me or Ann Bennington Helper to talk further. And we very much appreciate your participation in this program and any support that you're able to provide financially to the Clements Library. All right, and with that, um, we'll take a look and see what kind of wonderful questions we have. Um, Matthew is asking about passenger pigeons. Uh, passenger pigeons now extinct were mentioned. Can Russ expand on their consumption in the U in UP cuisine? Uh, was eating passenger pigeons widespread? Were they considered a delicacy or more like a subsistence food? Okay, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the passenger pigeon was uh, native to uh, native to North America, the United States, uh, and it passed through. Uh, they would pass through Michigan. They were. They existed in the. I guess you'd say hundreds of millions. There's talk of one time when they were passing uh, um, uh, Cadillac, uh, Cadillac, Michigan. Uh, the the I don't know how wide it was, but it, the 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 pigeons. The I don't know what you'd call it. The group of them, anyway, covered forty miles, and uh, uh, the the. Uh, uh, the, the sky grew grew dim because they cut into the sun and so on. So they were they were here by the millions. You could catch them by knocking them out of a tree with a with a stick. Um, and then later on, they decided to uh, take them out by nets and and shotguns and so on, but pr primarily by nets and completely wiped out. They, they were shipped by the, literally again, by the millions to restaurants in, uh, in you know, in major, major cities and so on. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, the last passenger pigeon just died in the Cincinnati Zoo in 1914. And that's the end of the passenger pigeon. And it didn't, uh, it's not like the buffalo that existed in millions. And then there were some and it's, uh, they've been able to revive the buffalo. The passenger pigeon is gone, but in its, um, you might say in its heyday, it was a food supply for uh, really millions of people. Uh, and, uh, wiped out because of that, uh, that demand. Interesting, thank you. I see that there are several questions related to Wisconsin. So a question about whether there are some similarities, um, you know, in cuisine, whether uh, the UP has cheese and whether there are supper clubs. Okay. Um, the supper club, <laughs> okay, that is, yeah, the 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 supper club uh, started in uh, Wisconsin Dells in the 1950, and um, then uh, spread. Well, it was also the the salad bar and the supper club kind of went hand in hand. But the supper club then is going to spread through the Upper Peninsula, and. Uh, usually consisted of a salad bar, but the original supper clubs in the 19, 1930s consisted, they were a place to go out to, you would get, you would get dressed up, uh, you would then uh, go and have dinner, uh, well, have cocktails and then dinner, and then there was music and dancing, and it was a, it was a major event in your in your life during that week and so on. And supper clubs then spread across the, across the Upper Peninsula were extremely popular. And then later on, you're going to have the introduction of the salad bar. 
that becomes uh, today the salad bar is kind of all but forgotten. And there aren't too many places. Those somebody will say yes, there's a a nest of them someplace, but in most cases they're gone. But the the the, the salad bar, uh, for instance, we have the Northwood Supper Club, and uh, it uh, was very elaborate. It was a place to go, and then they had a salad bar, and then the salad bar went from just salads to hot foods and so on. And you would then go to the supper club, to the salad bar and have a, your meal was around the, the soups and the, and the, uh, the meatballs and, and all of the other things you'd find there besides actually salads. So the, the, the supper club was, uh, was extremely popular. And today, uh, if I got it right, there is one that continues to exist in the Escanaba area that date was one of the earliest supper clubs uh, in the, in the upper, upper peninsula. But that's like the only one they, for instance, the Northwoods here in Marquette was in business for about 75 years and then uh, shut down. Now it's a, a brew pub. Uh, you can see where things have, <laughs> where things have gone, but the, um, but, but that was a, 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 a real characteristic of the, of the Upper Peninsula, the Supper Club. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we also have a couple of questions about, about fish. Andrew's mentioning that he associates the UP with uh, smoked fish shops, especially smoked white fish, and wondering about the origin of that. And... I think Tom was commenting on um, fish being part of Native American diet and or also to be used for fertilizing crops. Okay, to answer the last part first, fertilizing crops um, was used by Native Americans, not so much by those of the Upper Peninsula, but the Native Americans would put a part of a fish into, say, a, a, a mound of corn, uh, uh, corn uh, uh, kernels, I guess. Um, uh, but what happened was when the uh, when the Europeans came or the Americans came to the Upper Peninsula, you have to remember again, food had to be imported, had to be brought in, became very expensive. So they looked around and what's available? A uh, lot of, you know, a lot of water that's filled with a lot of fish. And so you're going to find from the very beginning then uh, all the various fishes, lake trout, white fish and so on, Siskiwet, uh, become popular. And there's even one story told about a woman in the, I guess it was the 1850s when the, the mines were just kind of opening. And uh, she was in Lance though, not in really, in the middle of mining country, but she said, you know, I've, I've prepared white fish, I've grilled it, I barbecued it, I boiled it, I made soup. And she went on and on with the various uh, uh, uses of wild fish and uh, of white fish. And she said, and it's only October. So they had the whole winter to go through, but they were eating then, they had kicked into the, uh, into the native diet they were eating large quantities of, of white fish and other types of fish. And this becomes extremely popular. And you have today, you have, uh, well, for instance, here in Marquette, we have Phil's uh, fishery and he has a smoked fish and, and it's extremely popular. And other places across the UP uh, 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 have smoked fish and so on. And then the, uh, for instance, the Grand Hotel points out that one of their very popular items in the menu is whitefish. Again, people come from a distance and want to try the, the local fish that they've heard so much about. Or you'll sometimes go to Detroit, Chicago, and so on, and find whitefish on the menu, and they make a big fuss, planked whitefish, and so on. So it's a, a, a Indian food that has been cre creola, creolized and has entered the uh, has entered the uh, the American diet, and certainly, uh, for instance, here in Marquette, we have uh, a restaurant, uh, the Verling, uh, that's sort of known for the variety of um, whitefish, or uh, not uh, varieties of whitefish, uh, varieties of the way it's served, uh, and uh, uh, and people 
really, anyone coming to Marquette has to go to the Verling for a whitefish meal. So it's become kind of like with the pasty, an iconic food in the, in the Upper Peninsula, but ties its origins back to uh, the native use of, of fish. Thank you. This is an interesting question that Tom has. He's wondering what kinds of foods are served in the prisons in the UP and wondering if there's any connection. What was the last part of that? In prisons in the UP. Oh, <laughs> prisons in the UP, nothing particular uh, special, except it was kind of interesting at well, the, 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 the major prison we have is the, have is the Marquette branch prison, the state, the state prison, that's high intense, uh, <laughs> tense prison. Uh, at one point, they, they, uh, they, uh, they um, got a boat that was involved in illegal uh, liquor running uh, during prohibition. And for a number of years, uh, the boat was used to fish and then provide fish for the prison, uh, the, the inmates. And um, the, um, during the, uh, the hunting season or, or uh, game wardens uh, would, um, when, they, when, they, uh, when they caught somebody illegally hunting and so on, they would then take the venison and uh, give it to you know, local jails, the Marquette Branch Prison, and so on, and uh, to groups like the Salvation Army. So that was kind of the, 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 uh, the prison diet doesn't have any kind of a, a youper, youper connection. Well, I mean, that's a little bit of one. Yeah. <laughs> um, Doug has a wonderful question. He's asking if you can tell the story of the external elevator at the House of Ludington. Okay, the external elevator at the House of Ludington. Uh, Pat Hayes uh, was not a firm believer in following what governments wanted him to do. And so he, uh, and I talked to, the, to a woman whose father was Pat Hayes's attorney and he would come home just shaking his head because Pat Hayes would do what he wanted to do. And uh, I guess he figured he had this very popular restaurant and so on. So at one point he wanted to put sort of an out, uh, he wanted to put a, an elevator on the outside of the building, which was kind of popular at, at one point. And so he put the elevator in and it was on city property. And he got into a lot of trouble, but in his usual uh, manner, he ignored the, ignored the trouble and the elevator stayed. And I don't know if it's still there, but for many years, I know it was, it was still standing, but it was sitting on, it was sitting on the sidewalk off, off of his property. Uh, but that was kind of a typical Pat Hayes way of dealing with, uh, with city problems. He just went ahead and did it. I love that. Um, so we have a few more questions, but we're approaching 1130. So I thought I would just ask to combine a couple things together. Ernie was thinking about how the price of the pasty might have changed over the years and whether it's moved up a bit. And Tom was asking along the same lines, you know, how much um, the foods have migrated from their original, um, you know, the way they were originally made and what you found about that. What, uh, wait a minute, just sum that up for me now. Um, has the pasty become significantly more expensive over the years and become more high end? Okay, uh, is the pasty kind of become more expensive? It still remains relatively, you know, in terms of foods and so on, and then what you get inexpensive. It's it's sort of like getting a, a large sandwich. So you'll, uh, I think they're selling for three dollars, five dollars, something like that, and it's seen uh, seen to be a 
you know, a nice lunch and dinner meal, you know, you can serve it and it's, it's there. You don't have to have a bunch of vegetables and other things around it. And so the, the price has stayed, it hasn't uh, become a, you know, an iconic food in the Upper Peninsula. So now you spend, uh, you, uh, you have to pay a, a special price, but it's, uh, it's remained relatively, um, I don't want to say inexpensive, but it's not, uh, they, they don't sell for $10 a piece. I put it put it that way, and so it's uh, it's maintained it's uh, maintained itself as a popular food for people. Yeah, a popular and reasonable food. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Russ. This has been wonderful. Okay, thank you for having me. I've appreciated it. And thank you everybody for joining us today, and um, have a fabulous weekend. Bye.